Well, greetings. The 60s was a golden era. <laughs> 200 million sperm <laughs> set off on a short journey in 1960. And one met an egg. And using very specific shapes on the head of that sperm, it was able to interact with that egg and it would allow it to fertilize that egg. Thank goodness. <laughs> a baby was able to develop. It developed from a fetus, and the cells of that fetus were able to talk to each other using shapes on their surface. And these shapes allowed the cells to talk with their environment and talk to each other and grow and grow until a little baby was born. Pretty cute one, though. Nine months later, in 1961, in June of 1961, a little baby boy popped out, bum first, of course. His parents named him Steve Henry, and he guessed it, that's me. My mother gave me antibodies. She gave me antibodies through her breast milk, and in her breast milk, these very powerful shape-defined proteins, which can recognize bad shapes, were able to protect me from attack from bacteria and viruses. Meanwhile, my own body was learning how to recognize these shapes of the environment, and it was remembering them so that should I be attacked by viruses or bacteria later on in life, I would be able to protect myself. I damaged myself a lot during my life. Fortunately, my body over time had learned how to recognize damage and it uses shapes on the cells to actually cause repair. So that was a good thing for me because uh, mostly it stitched me back together. Bacteria and viruses also invaded my body. This is actually a lovely little scanning electron microscope of um, sausages and peas. But um, if these little blighters are in your sausages and peas, you'll be puking out the back, I'm afraid to say. <laughs> but on the outside of these bacteria are little shapes very, very close to their surface. And these are the shapes that are important for our body to recognize. Our body will see the shapes on the outside of bacteria and actually mount an immune response to them. If you don't do that, well, you're probably dead. Someone out there might be dead. Today, my body is definitely losing shape. At least that's what my wife tells me. <laughs> and it's slowly losing its ability to recognize shapes as I get older. And that's a part of getting older. And eventually, it will forget how to do it completely. And perhaps lurking somewhere in my body and hiding its shapes from my immune system is a little cancer. Just sitting there waiting, hasn't poked its head up yet, but hopefully it stays out of sight. As you can see, some, but not all of our biology is based on shapes. It's based on the shapes that are present on surfaces, and they interact with each other. And you may remember to your school days, not those who were born in the 60s, generally they can't remember much, <laughs> the, this concept of lock and key. And here, it is, it's not exactly correct. It's a very much a gross oversimplification. And what this means is if a key, like the green key, can exactly match with a locking mechanism, the yellow lock in here, an interaction can be enabled. If, however, you were like me, you had the red key and it couldn't unlock the door, then no interaction will occur. And these shapes must exactly match. At the beginning, I told you about the little sperm interacting with the egg. So on the head of the sperm is a very specific shape, a bit like the green shape there. And on the embryo, or on the egg, is present the yellow shape. And since they absolutely will interact, a connection can occur and a fertilization will happen. If, however, the sperm came from another species, then they would not be able to interact. And it's one of the reasons that um, Different organisms or creatures cannot interact with each other. They must exactly match. Bacteria and viruses are very cunning. They learn these shapes. They learn to make shapes that will connect to the shapes on human cells. 
And so they could develop a shape like the green key, and on the human cells will be the yellow bit, and then they'll be able to connect. If they can't do that, then they won't connect. Fortunately, we, when we get invaded by bacteria and viruses, we can learn to recognize the shapes on their surfaces and make antibodies or cell-based receptors and go and attack them and hopefully make ourselves well again. But sometimes we get it wrong. Sometimes our body goes and makes immune responses to the cells or the shapes that are present on our cells, and this is where we get our autoimmune diseases. So just imagine what you could do if you could make a paint based on these lock and key shapes. Not a paint for color, but a paint for shapes. Maybe you could steal the shape that's present on a bacteria and paint it onto a drug to tell a drug to stick to a surface. Maybe you could take a paint that is present on a sperm and put it onto a piece of plastic to make something else happen. And this is what we did. We imagined it. We imagined it and we invented code technology. My journey with biological shapes started a reasonable time ago where there was a little bit of shape to the body. Fortunately, uh, I was able to find a wife in those early days, otherwise I'd be in a bit of trouble today. So I started when I was this, this little young fella way back in the 70s, um, working in the lab, and I was studying the shapes, a special kind of sugar shape. It's called a glycolipid. It has a sugar head on it, and it's a lipid tail, and was later to become the foundation for what would become code technology. But these molecules called glycolipids have this very spectacular ability to hop into cell membranes. So the whole basis of everything we know today was actually someone else's idea, but we took it further. For 20 years, sounds a long time, doesn't it? For 20 years, note the moustache, uh, I, I studied glycolipids, and I'm up in this lab up here in Sweden trying to figure out what they were. And after 20 years, I kind of had an idea Oh, a bit of a slow learner, I'm afraid. <laughs> Could I make a shape paint based on the concept of glycolipids to carry a function to a surface? And that's kind of the beginning of where we got to. But when we eventually did do it, we were in for a huge surprise. And for five years of trying to use natural glycolipids to make the shape paint, I was pretty unsuccessful which was unfortunate. So I then asked my colleague in Russia, so if you're in desperate and you need to solve a problem, ask a Russian. And I said to him, I can't work with these natural glycolipids. I need you to make me some synthetic variations of them. So being a, one of the top chemists in the world, he sat down in his lab and built me some five prototypes. And he sent them out to me. And the first one, we dissolved it, and it dissolved in water. Well, that's no good. Our molecules don't do this. But the other four, we were able to do what we were meant to do. We dissolved them onto sugars, so sugars. We dissolved them onto salts, and then we inserted them into cell membranes. And we were there. We had invented a technology where we could take molecules, synthetic versions, put them onto cells, and insert them into cell membranes. But, you know, being a bit slow, as I said before, a week later, I said, oh, don't forget the one in the fridge. Just, you know, check it before you throw it out. So we took it and we put it up against cells and it spontaneously inserted into the cells and it worked. It worked perfectly. This was both good news and bad news. One, we had invented what would become code technology. The bad news is we just had to dump five years of developments that we had done with natural glycolipids. But, hey, that's okay. Life's good like that. So we often call code technology a paint, and really, it's not a paint. In fact, people ask me what I do for a job, and I tell them I'm a painter. It's really good. It stops the conversation. <laughs> but actually, the molecules are not paint. They're really a self-assembling molecule that is amphiphatic. And this beautiful picture here, I'd love to have it on my wall at home, but my wife won't allow it, is, is a code construct. And it's got the little parts to it. It's got a functional head. That's the bit at the other end there. And we can change that functional head to be almost anything. It doesn't really matter what it's going to be. And we change it to be anything. 
But the bit in the middle, the spacer, loves water, and the bit on the other end hates water. And this ability to like and hate water is what drives these molecules to spontaneously assemble on any surface. That could be a cell, that could be a virus, that could be a piece of paper, plastic, rubber, it makes absolutely no difference. And of course, it's a very simple technology. And one of our most largest hurdles has been the pure simplicity of it. It's too good to be true. So you take one part of this molecule, and you take one part of a cell or a surface, and you put them together, and you go and have a cup of tea, and that's the entire method. Scientists don't like things that easy. They seriously don't like it. They like to take three months to do that. Well, you take one part of a surface and one part of a molecule, and to apply it to the surface with a paintbrush, if you want to, or you apply it by just dipping it in, spraying it on, or even put it into an inkjet printer and print it. And in one second, this molecule will spontaneously assemble on that surface. Pretty cool, really. We thought it was cool. In actual fact, the molecule was cool. We didn't know any of these things till we tried it, and it taught us what it could do. Today, we have hundreds of these molecules, and I'm not joking, hundreds of them. Each of them do different biological things, from very simple ones at the bottom to very complex next generation branch ones at the other end. Now you might be wondering what this means for you. You can't go down to Bunnings and buy this paint, okay? <laughs> but you may sometime in the very near future be using it. It might be in a commodity product, be that cosmetics. Did you know the cosmetic market is worth about $115 billion a year? I shake my head and I look at my wife. <laughs> but of course, the $40 billion oncology market, oh, a third of the size here, um, is also a significant place to be. So code will possibly be in the next generation of products that we can do. And we have shape paints that can do many things. We can modify a virus and teach it to go and find a tumor. We can modify a cell and tell it to stick onto a scaffold. We can modify a cell to tell it to stick anywhere, really. And we also have a range of paints that can do some, some other little things. So this here is a surgical implant, and on the side where the peas are not growing, no, sorry, those are bacteria, that we've colorized just so they look like peas. So if you don't like peas, you can go home and say, I don't want them. So bacteria and peas are the same thing. On the left hand, on my left-hand side, we put code molecules on there. We stuck this into a bacterial incubator, and the code molecules prevented bacteria growing on this. What could this mean for you? Well, very simply, it means that we can stop bacteria growing on surgical implants. And surgical implants are a major cause of infection in today's world. About 2% of them get infected. And we have a whole range of other things that we can do. But these are things that get scientists really excited, and maybe they won't get you excited. We can paint cells without causing any harm to the cell. And we can paint, because cells look like jellyfish, they're clear things and you can't see them. So we can paint the cell so that the scientists can see it, it will be able to do its job, and they'll be able to watch what it does. Or we can paint viruses, the little green spots of viruses having a jolly old time attacking those cells, just looks like the astrophysics, doesn't it? Um, and we can paint them because they're so small that the, they can see what they do. We paint them without harming them. We can also make cells stick onto things, a colorized SEM of red blood cells sticking to nanofibers. Now, why do we want to do this? Well, I've got a few kids, and I'll tell you why. It's so they don't run away, OK? In science, you want to be able to see what you're doing without it going all over the place. Have a few kids, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's a bit like having chairs and sitting a kid on a chair, better still gluing a kid on a chair, and then you can actually see what they're trying to do. You can study them. And all these, <laughs> all this makes for better, smarter, and faster research. But code technology is also being used most high profile in a cancer immunotherapy. There's a company in the UK trying to develop a cure for it. And what they're doing here is they are painting code molecules onto a single tumor. 
Now, our bodies already know how to recognize animal cells as bad. So if you inject a single tumor with a paint that tells the tumor surface that it is an animal cell, your body will instantly attack that tumor. Okay, and when it attacks that tumor, it will break it down. And that's a fragment of a sequencer cell schematically being shown. And it's taken to the immune system. And the immune system will not see the code paint. It will see the, co the new cancer, the real cancer antigens on there. So we tell, we're alerting the immune system to see the real cancer antigens. And then your body will learn them. And it will go out there and attack the real cancer antigens and clear that. Now, I'm going to take this again, but I'm going to explain it this time by analogy. Just imagine that your body is the neighborhood you live in, and the immune system is the police, and they drive around the neighborhood looking after it. And the cancers are drug dealers living in the houses in your neighborhood. Okay, And the police can't see them because they're living in the houses, not seen. And just imagine one day somebody comes along with a spray paint, a can of spray paint, and they write on the outside of one of the buildings, the drug dealers live in here. Okay, this time the police are probably going to drive around and they're going to see this sign and they think, the drug dealers live in there. And, and, and then they're going to go in there and arrest them. Okay, pretty simple. That's just like code technology would do it. And when they arrest them, they'll take them back to the police station and they will interrogate them. And they will spill their guts of where all the other drug dealers in the neighborhood live. Okay, and they'll keep records on file of what these drug dealers look like, and they'll be able to go out and clear the whole neighborhood of everybody. And it, should they come back, they won't. They'll have them on file. So in other words, if we tag just one tumor, we can teach your immune system to recognize all your tumors and destroy them all. Now think about that for a moment. Go to the doctor. Get an injection into one tumor. Go home, and your body will cure itself. This AGAL immune project will be in phase two clinical trials next year. They have completed the animal trials where they injected one tumor, and all the tumors in that animal responded. If they're able to take this the next step further, and that's a little bit of an if, but hopefully not too big, then they will have an solved another jigsaw, another part of the jigsaw of treating cancer. It probably won't cure all cancers, but it might capture a whole lot of them. Now, the cancer story is just one part of what we do. As I mentioned before, there are many, many other uses for code technology, and lots and lots of users throughout the world are using code technology to do all sorts of crazy stuff, including ourselves. And I, we believe you're going to see it in the next generation of drugs, therapeutics, cell therapies, cosmetics, um, and a few other commodities that uh, we know. In fact, Big Pharma has already engaged with us, and there are multiple of these projects going on. So I have a very nice statement that I like to make, and I think this sums up code technology very well. Code technology is limited only by your imagination. Thank you kindly.